Welcome to episode 7 of Go! The Mission. We are here broadcasting from St. Joseph, Michigan. I'm your host, Corey Johnson. Missions is my passion, and I'm thankful for another opportunity to educate, enlighten, and encourage those interested in missions. If this is your first time listening, or even if it's not, go ahead and like, subscribe, and share this with somebody. Just search for Go! The Mission on just about any podcast provider like Spotify, Apple, Google, and many more. You can also find the show on YouTube. My guest today is a good friend of mine, and we go way back. We studied at Southern Adventist University together. <laughs> Damari Banks, thanks for joining me on the pod today. Appreciate it, Corey. It's good to see you. It's good to be on here. Um, yeah, way back. I'm not even going to throw the years out there. We're just going <laughs> to no, let no, that. No. We'll, we'll let keep that, that on the DL. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for you uh, joining us here and you had a, a bit of a mission experience and even you know what you're doing right now is definitely considered mission but go ahead and give us a little bit of uh, background on, on what you did all right so initially when I wanted to do mission I knew while I was in college that I wanted to do some mission work and my mom the wise woman that she is I actually wanted to take a year off and do a year of uh, student missions and she told me no and I was like Ooh. why and she was like Go ahead and get your degree first. So she said, once you get the degree, then you can be free and you don't have to worry about coming back. And looking back, I appreciated that advice because I know it would have been a lot harder. So right after I graduated, I had planned to go to South Korea and I had already got taken steps to get all that stuff in place before I graduated. So I graduated in December and I flew out in February. So, I mean, it was wow. a really short, really short turnaround. So those are my immediate plans right after graduation and what I was doing there is I believe they still have this program as far as I know it's called the SDA Language Institute and mm -hmm. as far as I know they've been running it there since probably I want to say I think the 60s or 70s has been there for a wow. while I might okay. be wrong but some of the the dates are fuzzy in my mind but I know it had been running long before I got there so I went there and pretty much how you operate in it as a missionary is they give you a two week training period and then you teach primarily English classes and these are conversational English classes. So the only requirement was that you had a college degree in any subject. So you did college or sorry, not college. You did conversational English classes and then you also would do one religion class of a topic of your choice. And then on weekends, you helped run church services in whatever local area that you were in. So there were church programs that happened like that and then you said uh currently i'm a teacher that's what my degree is in so that experience that i had there was actually my first teaching experience after wow. graduation so before i had time to get into an actual classroom with american kids i was teaching korean kids and adults which i'll save some of that story <laughs> for later so okay <laughs> yeah that's a lot there man that's a lot there but uh, i want to start by asking you uh this question what does mission and service mean to you? So when I hear that question, I fully believe in being a Christian and being a follower of Christ. You can't fully embrace your Christianity unless you are involved in mission in some way, shape or form. That's what it means to me personally. That was one of the last things that Jesus told his disciples before he left. There's go therefore and baptize, mm -hmm. feed my sheep. So all of those things, that is it's just part of the territory of being a Christian. I honestly feel like I can't call myself a Christian if I'm not in some way, shape, or form trying to spread that message. And I see it as people who like sports or any other thing. I mean, if you're a fan of a, of a team, I mean, you're all about like, hey, you guys know about these players, you know about this stuff. It's the same thing when it comes to Jesus. If you're on his team, you got to spread the word. That's how, that's how it goes. <laughs> Man, that's what's up. And uh, you mentioned something uh, that kind of caught me off guard you mentioned that the religion class that you had to teach was of your choice how how does that work so what would happen at the start of every term and at over there we worked in two month blocks uh you would have to advertise your religion class and they were purely optional meaning people only took them if they wanted to so mm -hmm. each teacher would have to come up with a topic and they could decide what they wanted their class to be about. And then you would advertise it on a paper and you would hope that some people would come and, and show up. And what would happen over the course of the year is 
if you were new, there was always this little bit of skepticism, like, oh, who's this new person? Is anyone, <laughs> and people would worry, like, is someone gonna come sign up for my class? But after a while, if you develop sort of like a following or people got to know you, I mean, you could really put whatever title you want and people would, <laughs> would still show up. One of my friends would purposely put like, please don't take my, my class just as a joke and people would still sign up for it. So. <laughs> Well, uh, that's that's so I guess different than what I'm accustomed to because typically that they give you some kind of curriculum to teach mm -hmm. from. Um, what was their inspiration for having it just based on the teacher like that? So the key thing, as far as I can tell, is all about friendship evangelism, mm -hmm. and especially okay. when we're in another culture. They said in these smaller class periods, like the format was totally different from our English classes. Those classes were very structured, very scripted, even where you're supposed to do certain things at certain times and say certain things. The religion class was pretty much your own beast, if you will. So you would go in there and you really just wanted to connect with people and reveal little nuggets of, of truth in the gospel to them as time permitted. <laughs> all right, all right. And within that, um, because, I mean, you're at a, an SDA language institute, mm -hmm. so I'm assuming there's still some of a, a language barrier even trying to communicate the in the spiritual classes to them? Yes, you had people of varying degrees of English ability, and the way it was classified in our program, there were six levels. Your level ones would have been people who were just learning the basics, like, hi, my name is, those kind of things, which your level fives and sixes, you could converse with them on pretty much any topic at length and they could give you a broad discussion. So in your religion classes, it wasn't segregated by level. So you could have oh my. a level six person and a level one and you're trying to bridge those those gaps. <laughs> Did you ever have it where you're explaining something and the, the ones who are more advanced, they're getting it and maybe helping to communicate with the ones who, who aren't getting it as much? Trying to think back, it's been some time since I've done this. I can't really say in my own classes that there was such a broad variety of levels. Towards the end, I think I was getting more of the higher level students as far as English okay. speaking ability went. So that so made it a little it, easier. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's good. I know uh, in, in Palau, we have a lot of students who come to the high school and the elementary school from Korea, China, Taiwan, mm -hmm. Japan. And man, some of them come speaking zero <laughs> English. I know it. <laughs> so, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a challenge. Like, man, how am I, how am I going to try to communicate this stuff to them? It's it, you almost have to learn a different, just a different way of communicating, uh, just to try to keep them engaged. Which I have to admit, in my first couple of years there, it was hard. Like, I, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but because I didn't know how to bridge that gap. I would let them sleep in my class. Like, I just I just didn't know how to communicate to them. So that's it. definitely something that got better, <laughs> thank God, <laughs> over my time there. <laughs> and I had, I, I took I took a little more pride in making sure that everyone was engaged and getting something out of that class. But uh, it was definitely a struggle when I first started there. So did you have, uh, did you have something that was a big or a proud moment uh, in your experience there? I had so many good experiences and don't want to date myself again, so I'm gonna be, <laughs> I'm gonna be careful how I put this, but uh, smartphones didn't exist at that time, so it was a lot harder to keep track of people, connect with people either back home or people locally and I do regret in present there were some really good friendships that I made there but just because the timing was where it was I wasn't able to keep those outside of the time that I spent there which I think nowadays it would have been easier but there's um where am I going with this there was a guy who took my level one class when I first started and I was there for a year and his name is uh is it okay if I use names on here I don't want to yes it is it is okay <laughs> no problem so his name was uh, Lee Jong Young was his name. And he was one of those ones that he had very little command of spoken English when he first started. He started off as a level one student. And from level one to every term, he kept moving up. And his 
language progressed, so I had him as a level one student. And by the time I got to the end of my time there, he was a level five, a level six student. Wow. So just to see that progression. And he and I had a shared interest in certain things. Like he loved basketball, I loved basketball. So I remember, um, I'm trying not to give dates because I'm really going give to myself, <laughs> give myself away here. We're in the same boat, my man. <laughs> but I remember during that particular summer, there was a, well, people might catch this up to this anyway, but there was a World Basketball Classic that happened. This guy bought front row tickets to the World Basketball Classic for me and him. Just Wow. And, and I was blown away, like just that level of friendship. And if you go back and watch like the, the the replays on TV, I can actually see myself in the audience because our seats were that close oh, to the beginning. Oh man! <laughs> so I'm just like, wow. And I love that guy to death. Um, I kept up with him a little bit when I first came back, but I just feel like it would have been so much easier. And I look back now, and I don't know where he is. And I would love to just kind of see where his life is taking him and what he's mm -hmm. up to now. But I really don't know how to get a hold of him mm -hmm. at this point. Dude, man, that that's really cool. <laughs> that's really yeah. cool. And on the flip side of that, what do you think might have been one of the hardest things that you went through, or what was the biggest struggle about being there? Uh, biggest struggle. I'm very close to my family, and like I was saying earlier, technology wasn't where it is now. I didn't see my family for an entire year. Mm. Skype was kind of just getting its its legs back then so we would skype every now and then uh no smartphone so there was no facetime any of that so it was hard and then my uh my oldest niece she was born the year i was gone so i didn't actually meet oh, her man. at all until i came back from there so mm -hmm. there was a lot of things that happened with my own personal family that i just missed out on just because i was far away but i don't see it as missing out on but just things happened and it's just i was there and they were somewhere else so mm -hmm. i see Kind of building off of that, like, did you find, did you find that there were growing experiences that you went through, or like growing pains that you went through in being there? Oh, so many. Tell us about so that. So many. So, I was fresh out of college. I was 21 when I went there. Didn't have a job or anything. This was one of my first official positions after graduating, and I have an elementary education degree. So I had only had experience teaching children from all of my education classes, even my student teaching. I remember going there and after our two week training period, they give you a two week training period where you practice on the other teachers that come in at the same time as you before they ship you off to your respective destination around the, the country. And I remember the day of my first class, I had all adult classes. Oh no. And I'm sitting there like, what do I do? I don't know how to teach adults. I have had no experience with this. I'm used to teaching children. And I remember we had our little staff room and it's probably five minutes before my class is supposed to start and all these people are filing in and my coworkers that had all been there for a while, they're like, oh, you need to go, your class is there. I'm like, <laughs> I'm nervous. I don't know what to do. There's a room full of adults and I've never taught adults. And, and I knew for adults, a fact that- You mean like older than you adults? Yeah, they were all older than me. That's the other thing. It's like, I'm some young kid fresh out of college and I have a room full of professionals that I'm supposed to go in here wow. and try and teach English to. And it's like, I had nothing but nerves. <laughs> That's such a different dynamic. Wow. Well, so I prayed and then I ended up going in the room and I'll admit it was the first couple of class sessions were... We're a little rough, but uh, we, we made through by the grace of God. <laughs> How'd you end up uh, connecting with them or, or getting them to kind of take that you're their teacher and they can learn something from you? Uh, when you go there, you, you have a certain level of respect, and that is a culture that is very respective of people that teach and are involved in the professional fields. And the fact that I came as a native English speaker, that sort of already influence me in a positive direction for them and I learned a lot of things along the way that I maybe would have done differently but uh some of them worked in my favor for example when you go there I had my roster list of all the students and they're all listed by their Korean names which I didn't know that typically most teachers especially at level ones they would help their students come up with sort of English names that they could use 
I didn't know that. Mm. So I spent all this time learning all their Korean names and that's what I called all of them until I asked one of my coworkers, I'm like, how do you guys remember all these names? They're like, oh, you normally give them an English name or you help them pick one. And they, I was like, oh, I'm over here calling them by whatever was on the roster. That's because that was, was there. So I just think me taking some of those steps to embrace their culture in that way. And they saw that I was willing to, uh, to try because I know I did some stuff probably not the greatest, but <laughs> so you live and you learn. Yes, 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 indeed. <laughs> How did you see uh, they have a, a great respect there for teachers, as you mentioned, um, mm -hmm. within within the school. And I'm kind of curious on the outside of it, too. I'm sure you were involved. Uh, how did you find pe people's overall receptiveness to what you were doing there? Hmm. So Korea is an interesting culture in and of itself. Like I, I started off teaching adults and then they do have children's classes in the language institute I work. So I ended up having sort of a mixture of of both mm -hmm. and i'll talk a little bit about the the kids for a while the the school that we worked at the kids would have known it as a hagwon is what it would have been called and these are kids that to this day just the amount of school that they have to do even at young ages just boggles my mind where they would go to their regular schools six seven hours a day and then afternoons they would go to all these specialized institutes or hagwons as they were and ours was just one of many throughout the country. We specialized in teaching English, but they would go to one for English and they would go to one for music or, or math. So you had all these young kids, I'm talking elementary school, middle school, even high school, where these kids would be literally in some type of learning environment for hours a day. I'm not talking six hours. They're easily double that. And it's like, wow, at 10 years old, I don't know if I would have been able to. <laughs> no, I, I'd have had no shot. <laughs> Man, that's incredible. Yeah, they really value that. I guess, I, I don't even know what kind of level to compare it to. Because I thought school that we're, as we go through it here was enough. <laughs> that, man, that's something different, <laughs> different level. Oh, different level over there. Just the amount of focus and emphasis they put on getting ahead via education. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, within... Uh, the culture itself do they have i've only been to south korea on one occasion so i'm not sure what the adventist presence there or culturally how they are on a spiritual sense uh what can you tell us about that so the language institute was so heavily invested in adventist culture there in korea that at the time i'm thinking there was maybe about 30 to 32 language institutes spread out across wow. the country and not only was it an institute there was an adventist church that was a part of it so we sort of doubled as a religious center and an educational center there were very few as far as i could understand i couldn't be mistaken there were very few just standalone Advent, seventh day adventist churches that weren't attached to a language institute they might have been more out in some of the more rural areas but i know for our intents and purposes that's how we connected with a lot of the uh, local adventist members is that they would come to our institutes on weekends because the church service was there and they also populated some of our uh, junior teachers is what they called them some of the korean nationals that helped work in our program a lot of them would be members from the church they were particularly younger excuse me, younger ladies and they would be part of our program as employment and helping run some of the junior classes from a Korean language perspective and then we would pop in as English speakers and we would kind of of tag team from there so in a way there were not too many people and this is just from my experience that were not affiliated with the institute in some way there weren't just like a bunch of pockets of Adventists that weren't connected with that I see. and I know there is um there is an Adventist university there, uh, Samyuk. And we went there early in our stay as sort of like a, a trip. I honestly don't remember a whole lot about it just because it's been so long, but I do know there is one Adventist university there as far as I can recall. Okay. Man, that's cool. It, it's so different, again. <laughs> but that's the beauty of missions, though. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's getting to experience different things and seeing how the culture that we bring to the table fits in and and blends with uh, other cultures. 
Um, if I had to ask you, what was the biggest takeaway that you had from your experience there? Uh, what would you What would you think it would be? The biggest takeaway was learning how to really draw on God when you don't feel it. Mm. And I say that because we taught classes five days a week, and this was all year thing. We didn't have like summer breaks off or anything like that. We would have somewhere between, depending on the term, we could have as much as like a week to a week and a half till some terms the turnaround was like four or five days. So that was as much vacation time as you got with these little brief pockets throughout the year. But I mean, you're teaching all the time and not only are you teaching, you're running weekend programs, Sabbath schools, Vespers, all those things. So it becomes really easy to get spiritually drained being a part of there. And I had to learn, okay, at what point do I draw back and do I need to go off by myself and have sort of a recharge time because it's hard to give or present what you don't have. And People are perceptive, regardless of cultures. I mean, students That's can true. tell when you, when you don't have it. When you don't have it, they that know. Day. <laughs> they know. <laughs> man, that's man, that's cool. And uh, what was it like leaving? When it was time to leave, like, oh. what, what was that like? Oh, that that was tough. Uh, I'm trying to think of how how I want to put this. <laughs> I'll see how I want to put this. So there for a year made so many connections and anytime you go to those kind of programs i had signed a year contract right up front so i knew i was going to be there for at least 12 months and as you get to the end of your contract especially if you are well received they obviously want you to stay longer so they're like are you sure you don't want to renew for you can try another (laughs) six months or four months or another year and i was feeling incredibly homesick at the time like i said i hadn't seen my my family i hadn't really had any connection with any of them for a year and part of me wanted to stay longer part of me wanted to go back to my family and then there was um a girl that was was there (laughs) and she was a fellow teacher and i we both had maybe mutual interest of each other and part of me thought if well if i stayed there then that was a possibility of something that might happen down the road so there was all this bag of mixed emotions of should i stay should i go but ultimately the homesickness went out and i was like ah gotta go home i've been over here for a year and i miss my family and just being home so i went home (laughs) so you i can uh, i can definitely relate to that mixed bag it uh it hit me the most after this the last year that i was in palau for sure uh i was telling another one of my buddies on a a couple episodes ago how I was kind of a jerk to people who came for a year and left because I knew I was coming back but (laughs) but (laughs) it it got me and I I, you know I used to laugh about crying and all that stuff but I shed some tears and I was I was definitely uh not in the best places mentally and emotionally when it came to actually leaving so I, I definitely resonate with that but that's not the end of your mission experience because you've been a couple other places since then. And I, you know, I wanna hear about those experiences and how what you've learned and experienced in South Korea played into that. So I'll throw this disclaimer out. I work for the Adventist school system and that is by design. I went to public school growing up, but I intentionally wanna work in Adventist school system because I see that as a mm-hmm. mission field like that's hands down why I do that and some of the places that I have worked have a bit of a I'm more of a mission mind to them I spent some time over in Hawaii which there's some Adventist schools there but that's definitely more mission culture because it's not just a, I mean you have a lot of the same classes and everything but just the the culture is mm-hmm. different and then um this trip has inspired me. I never wanted to let my mission spirit die. And being a teacher, I'm able to have summers off and almost every summer, if I'm not moving or doing some significant thing, I always try and have a short-term mission in there somewhere, two weeks, three weeks. And I've probably done six or seven mission trips over wow. summers. And I, I try and pass that along to my uh, current students as well. I try and have our schools do mission trips wherever we can. Cause I just, 
there's just something about being able to live out a mission experience that you can't put into <laughs> words you can't read it in a book you can't you just gotta oh, that's it. so cool like, i didn't even know about that part what what different places have you been to for, on the short-term mission trips so uh uh didn't been to jamaica worked at an orphanage wow. there for a couple weeks did uh probably a three week long evangelistic series in where was it costa rica did a maranatha building mission trip in mm. panama so <laughs> i mean i've had my fair share of experiences. oh man that is so cool <laughs> see for those of y'all listening just because i'm the host doesn't mean i know everything about the people i'm interviewing I'm learning new stuff just in, in the <laughs> conversations we're having right now. <laughs> and I'm getting inspired because I, I want to go in and experience missions in a bunch of different places too. That's that's awesome. <laughs> so how would you say that all of your experiences, missions, how does that really play into uh, what you're doing right now and how you go about being a teacher in, in the school, the Adventist school system now? So I think people... I don't know if they forget or maybe there's just some oversight, but our schools more or less were always intended as mission fields, especially ones outside of the United States. And that's something that's always weighed heavily on my mind because I go work at one every day is, yes, many of my students have maybe come from Bible families or they've grown up in the church, but we have a responsibility to teach them and not just teach them. We want to inspire them to put their faith into action. And I tell my students all the time, if I'm, if what I'm doing here is not helping you get closer to Jesus in whatever subject, I'm mm. doing it wrong. And God needs to de- God needs to deal with me on, on that. So every experience that I've had, I take back something that I can share with my students if it's just a perspective, if it's some literal skill that I can can do, but every experience that I've had has allowed me to approach my day-to-day interactions in a very intentional way, especially when it comes to to Man, That's legit. And I wanted to point out something that you mentioned there. Um, a lot of times I don't I'm not sure if and I can't say this because I'm not really in it. Maybe you could speak more to this than I could for sure, but uh at least from the the perspective of teaching in Adventist schools here in America, it often seems like from the outside that it's more of a school than a mi- viewed more of as a school than a mission field. And I say that because you know the students go in and they're expected to take the Bible courses, they're expected to deal with people who are within the same religion, and uh, you you get kind of this general. What am I trying to say? You get kind of this general feel of what the religion is about, but you pointed out that key thing, making, putting their faith into action. And that aspect of it, it's not something, it's not a vibe I always get from the students who attend those schools. And maybe that's something that comes from the teachers, I'm not sure. But, you know, because sometimes you end up with students who have gone through the Adventist system all the way up. And then when they get to say high school or university, they have zero interest in Adventism or Christianity or God in general. And it seems like, hey, preach. <laughs> you know, hey, preach. I, I don't know. It just seems like there's some kind of a disconnect there. And I feel like this mentality that you have of not just seeking to teach the content for content's sake, but trying to make the faith real, trying to put it into action. Like even that you're, you're able to be a, uh, an anchor in the school there saying, hey, here's a mission trip opportunity. Let's go do this. Why? Because this is how we make real the thing that we believe in that we talk about in class every day. That's huge, man. That That's really big. And, and I'm impressed by that. And I appreciate that because of what I've seen in, in you know, generally speaking, in some Adventist schools. Well, let me let me let me speak for on sure. that for a little bit. You, you, you brought it up and uh, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Like I mentioned earlier, I went to public school from kindergarten to 12th grade. My family is converts to Adventism. We are our generational Adventism. My mom converted when I was young. My dad is not Adventist to this day. So we had a lot of just growth just along Mm -hmm. the way. Went to Southern, got immersed into the Adventist culture, but I always had sort of this outsider perspective because I didn't go to uh, Adventist school. So being a missionary and then coming back and working exclusively in Adventist schools, in my mind, 
my thought is if we're not training kids to be rocks and fountains of our faith, what are mm. we really doing? I tell my kids this in class. I tell them this all the time. You can go to any other school in this town and get education. There's schools that are free, but we're, your parents pay money. People pay money for mm. you to come here. And if we're not giving you mm. Jesus, if you're not taking away some spiritual application, we might as well mm. close our doors because we're not, we're doing you a disservice. <laughs> oh, so, man, I can soapbox this time. I can go on this all day. No, man. I, I definitely feel you on that because, like, one of the struggles I've had being here, like, I'm not even in a position to recruit or uh, do anything in terms of Andrews University, but I've literally heard of professors that are here that will tell their students, don't do it because it'll mess up your education. And it seems like the point is being missed completely about what Andrews University stands for as an Adventist institution, like Adventist educational experience. And man, to, ah, oh man, I'm, I'm, I'm just glad that there's people like you who, who get this <laughs> and that you're telling your students this and they're able to hear that because especially, uh, just out of curiosity, like what, what grade levels do you teach? So, uh, primarily I've taught high school. I've taught as low as fifth grade, but I'd say the vast, bulk of my career has been pretty much seventh grade okay I mean, yeah i mean that's perfect because it goes right with what i was saying like that's to me is that critical age where you can really drill in what's important and what's not and what they what they take a lot of students from my experience what they take leaving high school uh those principles are what they often build their experience around after they go into college after they go into the world from there like, i know for me i grew up in the advent system so completely opposite as your experience but mm -hmm. the thing was, by the time I was in high school, I, I felt my interest in spiritual things just completely declining. And my disinterestedness there was, <laughs> it was bad. Like it was bad. And it's kind of funny that I ended up at Southern. That's a whole different story. And I keep telling people, <laughs> uh, the life and times of Corey Johnson, that series is coming out soon on the podcast. You'll hear a little bit of my story and how I am to where I am right now. But it was not my intention. It just happened to be the only uh, university that my parents would let me go to that wasn't Oakwood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, man, uh, man. you know, nothing against Oakwood. I got an uncle who teaches there. Got some family who've been to school there. My, my little sister, she went to school there. But I just wanted uh, a different experience. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> got it. But, you know, that that's the only one that they allowed me to go to. And my first year and a half, there was a struggle because of the way my mind was <laughs> coming out of high school. And thankfully, there were some professors there who set an environment where I, I started asking questions. I didn't feel forced to do anything to doing anything. But when when I started asking more questions, I was able to get answers. And it was. I was able to plug into the experience and, you know, ultimately have my experience as a missionary, which is all part of the story. But, you know, I, I'm I, again, you're dealing with that key age in our Adventist institutions where those students, man, the mentalities that they get from you and your, your colleagues, that's going to shape the way that they move forward into life when they're on their own. Like those principles, it's a big deal. <laughs> I tell, I tell, even when I was in uh, PMA, I would tell the students, uh, it's not about the classwork that you're doing. It's not about like getting 100% on these things. What you're learning is principles. The principles that you learn on this level will determine your success on the next level. And if you can get the principle of, okay, I need to manage my time so I can get my work yes. done. That principle is what's gonna help you on the next level. Not necessarily acing this project or, or getting 100% on this, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And man, you're you're instilling the right principles. Like, I'm gonna give you that shout out, bro. You're instilling the right principles in those kids that they need to be able to succeed on the next level. So I appreciate that, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. No, I appreciate you. I gotta hop back on the soapbox sure. one Absolutely. more time. Because you said something that, that, res that resonated with me. So much of what I've seen as an Adventist educator, so much of what you described and that we have kids that go through our system for eight, 10, 12 years and they get out and they're like, 
I don't know where mm. I stand spiritually. In some ways, it's almost like we do them mm. mercy service. It's like why, why are you, why are you not <laughs> where we, where you feel connected to to Jesus? And it's like your parents, people yes. have invested so much time mercy, and money yes. in you being here, and we're not getting the results that we need. But the word that you said, and you said Southern helped you with this, is environment. As Maybe you're not a principal, or maybe you're not involved in some school, but if you're a youth leader, if you're a church member, in my case, if I'm a classroom teacher, I have the responsibility of creating an environment where kids can be mm. real. No, I don't expect them to be perfect. I tell them that all the time. The fact that you go to an Adventist school sort of kind of puts this banner over your head of, oh, you go to the, the church school, so that means you must be good or holy or all these things. We all kind of <laughs> snicker because we all go, right. oh, that ain't true, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> but at the same time your parents are here because you are ready and willing and want to learn and i find that the key is always the environment if you create that environment and you, you push kids it the growth happens organically the holy spirit mm. moves you just have to be willing to be be used in that in that way and <laughs> i just had to hop back on and, and say absolutely that i don't want any kid that's ever been in my class that i've ever taught to just be like he didn't try and point us towards Jesus. Our school experience mm. was left lacking, especially in the mm -hmm. spiritual department. Because if we're left lacking there, it's like, what's the point? What's the point? Why That's even so have these? <laughs> man, I, I totally, totally am vibing with that, man. That, that's so cool. And given your experience and, and where you are now, the things that you've been able to to see, witness, and, and grow with, um, for, for people out there who might be considering the mission field, uh, what what kind of encouragement would you have for them? I would say go, go now rather than later. And I know in my case, my mom actually delayed me a little bit, but in retrospect, it was the right move. But if you have an opportunity, I would say do not hesitate. If it's a week, if it's two weeks, if it's something long-term, these things you can't script them they push you out of your comfort zones especially if you're getting outside of your own country your own backyard i mean it challenges you in ways that you can't experience i can't push the benefits of mission trips or any type of mission experience mm -hmm. enough and when i say mission experience that just brought up something to to mind um and you can stop me oh no no go, go for it man i'm enjoying here, this but uh, mission experiences, I want to comment on that. Many times people think a mission trip has to be some long distance international trip. One of the most impactful mission trips that I've ever been on in my life was we went to Atlanta and I took some of my students from, I was working and living in Las Vegas at the time. It was during the summer and we took some kids over there and we did urban hmm. ministries, just stuff in the inner cities in places that people probably wouldn't go unless you live there, most people probably wouldn't even have mm -hmm. business there. And you get your mind open to so many things. The one ministry that stood out to me the most is, um, there was this ministry, we partnered up with another church group and they had this thing called Princess Night. And I love telling the story, so I tell it to my own personal students all the time, but they would essentially go out on the streets and look for prostitutes on Friday nights and say, here's a flower, if you want, an option that's an alternative to this lifestyle you're free to wow. come with us or we just want you to know that you're you're loved and accepted and we had the opportunity to go on one of these princess night runs and it was just amazing to see the experience sadly pretty much every girl that we saw wow. was a teenager of some sort and we had teenage girls there with us and they were seeing this firsthand and they got to get out of the car and talk to some of these girls and they were just like our minds are blown i mean we met some pimps well it's just like <laughs> the kind of experiences that people have it's like mission experience like you can't script that you can't put that down you can't write it in a book but it just in my head there's people out there and, that, and i appreciate people that are willing to go into those areas and reclaim god's territory because that's sometimes an area that's overlooked there are situations just like that so your mission experience don't think it has to be some elaborate mm -hmm. long distance long term kind of thing it can just be hey there's an area here there's a need i'm willing to put my foot out here and fill it 
That's awesome. And it sounds like you're you're kind of summing it up by what you started by saying it's a mentality. Like if if we are followers of Christ, it, it means that we're supposed to go. It's it's not a thing that we can pick and choose about. The mentality to reach out to people who are not in our comfort zone, who are not in our, our culture, who are not in our, our normal day to day, that's that's who we've signed up to be when we sign up to follow Jesus. And I love that. That's what it is. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Can't agree more. <laughs> Damari, I gotta thank you so much for joining us here on the pod. Man, this was this was awesome. And I'm glad I got to do this just to hear of all the other awesome things you've been able to do and how your mission is still continuing right now from from the home classroom <laughs> as we're dealing with this uh, <laughs> pandemic and all of that, man. But it's been an encouragement to me. Like I'm getting chills right now just thinking about the different things that we've been able to discuss here. And I, I really appreciate it, man. Hey, man. Thanks for having me on. I, I appreciate it. I'm always down to discuss <laughs> things, especially when it comes to, to mission and serving God. So. For sure, man. We're going to have to get you back on here another time. <laughs> yeah, for sure. For those of you guys listening, I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Go The Mission. Once again, this is your host, Corey Johnson. Remember, every other weekend, a new podcast will drop. And on whatever platform you're tuning in on, like, subscribe, and share so we can continue to get the mission out there. If you have any questions about missions or you're wondering how to be a missionary, let me know. You can reach me by email using gothemission at gmail.com or feel free to drop a comment or message through social media or YouTube. And finally, remember, to exist is not enough. We out here to be out here. Until next time, peace.